Over 200 Community Futures offices are located throughout Canada and provide small business services to people living in rural and northern communities. In Manitoba, there are 16 regions, five of which are located in the north. Community Futures North Central Development serves this North Central region, which consists of 17 communities. Our office is guided by a board of directors comprised of members from each community. So what exactly do we do? We assist communities with business and community development by offering a variety of supports and resources, such as business loans, training workshops and information sessions, and providing one-on-one -on -one support to entrepreneurs. In other words, we are the place to go to when you want to find out how you can start, manage or grow a business or get a community project off the ground. Over the next few weeks, you are going to hear us talking about social enterprises. So I want you to get familiar with what a social enterprise is. Basically, it's a business that can be run by an individual, a group of partners or even a whole community. But rather than its focus being on making a profit, the focus is more on how the business helps the community, or in other words, what is the social impact of that business? It kind of falls somewhere in between being a non-profit organization and being a for-profit business. So welcome to Business Basics Community Conversations, and let's see if you can get inspired to make a difference in your community. Good afternoon. I would like to first start by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 5 territory, home of the Cree, Dene, Inuit, and Métis people. How are you doing, Roy? Pretty good. We got through another blizzard, but it's just, you know, once a week, you get used to it. <laughs> yes. So for those that are new to our show, my name is Michelle Pruder, and I work at Community Futures North Central Development, and my co-host... Hi, I'm Roy Mexted of Churchill Entertainment in Churchill, Manitoba. Okay, so to start us off, I again want to kind of review what we've been talking about these past couple of weeks. We've been learning about social enterprise and what that means. And we've had a couple of guests so far. And uh, Roy, if you can bring up that chart for us that shows the spectrum of social enterprise. I mentioned last week that the greenhouse fits sort of more on the orange side where that traditional charity is not quite a whole charity or full charity because um, it does make money, but it is somewhat funded. So it's more towards that end. And then last week we met with Ken Biggity who had the Cree puppets and that one is a for-profit business. So that's leaning more towards the traditional business side, the blue one. Um, definitely a business he's there to make a profit but also he really you could tell right from the start that he loves what he does and he would probably do it even if he's not making money and he does volunteer a lot of his time and go into you know different schools and teach kids uh, about some subjects like bullying or he was mentioning about COVID and just you know kind of lecturing people a little bit through the puppets but he definitely has a social impact and um, so two different organizations two different sort of where they land on the spectrum but still i would consider both of them somewhat of social enterprises and today we have another guest and uh, i want you to think about where do you think that business fits in on that spectrum and um yeah, and one other thing I wanted to bring up before we start with our guest was that we've been getting a lot of really good advice from our guests. And I wanted to review sort of those nuggets of wisdom. And uh, Roy is going to bring up for us some slides that we'll just go through. I don't know if you can remember anything that you've learned from the show, uh, Roy, or some of our other viewers. But one of the things that Ken said last week was love what you do. And, you know, we might not always love everything we're doing with that business, but for the most part, we want to love what we do. We want to know that it's purposeful, that we're making a difference. And the next little nugget. Know your community and what they need. And this came from um, Carly Basler of uh, Rocket Greens up here in Churchill. And 
you know, you can start with something about, you know, luck you really love, but also, you know, try to tie that in with uh, what you think the community really needs. Because if you're doing something that supports the community, I guess, you know, they're going to support you right back. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And the third one that Carly had also mentioned was figure out your financing sources early on, right? Like, especially depending on the size of the project, if there's going to be a lot of different funding sources, you need to get those all sort of lined up before you actually start anything. And even if you're just starting a small sole proprietorship, you know, just on your own, really think about what can you manage in terms of the financial part of it. Hey, <laughs> start with what you good. <laughs> I love this one. Yeah. And, and I don't know if you remember, he, Ken mentioned that, you know, he, instead of starting with canvas, painting on canvas, he was painting on the back of birch bark. Hmm. You know, wow. like, start with what you have and um, you can always grow from there. When I started playing the guitar, I just started playing on a piece of wood. <laughs> I didn't even have any strings. Like I was that, it's, you know, it's if something, passion comes from inside, you make it work and never, never blame your tools, right? Excellent. Okay, so Roy, do you want to introduce our guest for today? I'd love to. Well, we just had to tell this guy to behave because he's just so passionate about his, uh, his, his enterprise and his business. So uh, we're going to bring in Mr. Stephen LaRoque, LaRoque from Arctic Gold Honey. This guy is a real character. He knows all about his bees and his honey. We're going to hear a lot of bee jokes today, aren't we? I've got as many as I can come up with. <laughs> hey, how have you been, mate? <laughs> Hi, Stephen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you for having me on your guys' show. So, Stephen, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? What is Arctic Gold Honey? So, uh, roughly around six years ago, me and my father decided that, um, that we would try and uh, see if it was even possible here in northern Manitoba to actually produce raw honey. So uh, over the last six years, we've been able to uh, take a look at that. We've been able to be successful at being able to produce this, this specialty raw honey out of the boreal forest, which uh, has a beautiful uh, wildflower flavor from all of the flowers like Labrador tea, uh, goldenrod, wild roses, different kinds of clovers. And it's been referred to as a true taste of northern Manitoba, which we're very proud of. And now we are at the point where we are able to, you know, take this product and sell it as a local Manitoba made product. We, we, um, we're from up north, so we deal with a lot of other food uh, producers. You know, we have fishing lodges, we've got birch syrup out of the paw, we've got wild rice. So this is another thing that we are able to produce specialty products up here in the north that, um, that people have really started to take on as their own, basically, right? Wow, that is amazing. Look at all those products. Um, so... Stephen, one of the questions I always ask our guests is, you know, what is the need or the opportunity you saw? And, you know, you mentioned about you and your dad wanting to start this business, but how did you determine that there was actually a market for it, that you, that people would want to buy this? Well, you know, food is always something that people need, okay? And where we live, you know, especially in these times of COVID and everything else, you know, it's even more pressing when we see the disturbance within these uh, chains that we're so used to for our products, for our supplies, for uh, employment, all of these kind of things. So, you know, this got us thinking, you know, here in the North, we have an excellent opportunity to um, produce a specialty food product, number one. Number two, we're able to create seasonal employment. And with this product, we're able to, that, that we are producing, that we work with local stores, it gives these local stores another product, which also employs a lot of the people in our community. So uh, there, there are so many good benefits uh, that we've seen in it that 
um, what we're doing now is really looking at working with whoever, uh, you know, has the, the uh, mindset of having bees within their uh, community to help mentor, help, you know, move them along so that we could truly look at this as a new industry for Northern Manitoba, right? Now that we've been successful, why not take our successes as an example and apply them to different areas, right? Yeah, exactly. So it sounds like you're very open to working with other communities or other people who are interested in maybe starting beekeeping themselves. Oh, yes, definitely. Like, um, uh, there are a few organizations out there that also work with these outlining areas, like uh, the Northern Association of uh, Community Councils. There is Food Matters Manitoba. And, you know, the people in the community really have to put forth the idea to these organizations. And then there's Community Futures, right? Just to say, hey, this is something that we would like to take a look in our community you know, as, as a reliable food source. And once that ball starts rolling, then that's when that you get into these very unique partnerships that you can create. Like, for example, we have uh, partnerships with uh, Valet here in town, Highways and Transportation, the Department of Highways and Transportation, uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, Manitoba Hydro, uh, you know, so these are all partners that we work with uh, that see the benefit in what we're doing with our bees and, uh, you know, the overall kind of project of creating seasonal employment, creating a food source. And, you know, bees are the indicator of a healthy environment. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of times when you tell people, okay, well, what do you, can you do for the bees? Go out and plant flowers. You know, so any, any, any little thing that you can do to encourage it is just a benefit. I see the video of my, my front lawn, which is a garden. And, you know, a lot of the outlining, uh, a lot of the outlining uh, areas have gardening programs, but, you know, a lot of people um, don't know that, that honeybees uh, with the pollination rate you would get a 70% higher pollination rate with honeybees on your garden. So that's why I've got that hive in the corner. Now, I never had bees in that hive. That was the first year, but somebody obviously had bees in the community because there were honeybees coming to it. So they were on all my vegetables and all and everything else, right? So, so you know, these are how things work hand in hand. And I find when you work with nature, uh, you know, instead of against it, it's a lot easier. So, mm -hmm. so S Stephen, how dangerous is it working with bees? Well, you know, number one, I'm allergic to bees. So I carry a EpiPen. Uh, you know, bees aren't, you know, what people think that they are like a hornet where that they're just going to come out and sting you. Uh, you learn how to work around the bees. Uh, there's been many times where like I had a chair set right next to a hive and there's thousands of bees coming and going and they're so busy working that that's what that they're focused on. Any time that I have been stung, it was my fault. It was by accident, which I did something that I shouldn't have done and I should have known better. And that was their only reaction because what a lot of people don't understand versus a wasp if a honeybee stings you, then it dies, where a wasp mm -hmm. doesn't. So its last resort is actually to sting you, right? Oh, but still, that's determination for you. You're allergic to bees, and that didn't stop you. You know, some people <laughs> would have said, well, uh, well, I definitely can't be a beekeeper. You know, that's like the one thing you can't do. But for you, you just, uh, you know, didn't let it bother you. That's pretty amazing, actually. Um, wow. Yeah, totally. So, Stephen, um, you know, we could probably keep you here for a long time and ask you a, a whole bunch more detailed questions. And, you know, maybe that's a workshop down the road if there's some interest that we could have you back and, and actually have you teach people sort of what those steps are. I guess my question to you is what advice would you give someone who wants to start this? Like what's the first steps that somebody or a community could take? 
the first step that I think that a community should take is that they should talk about what's in their community as far as say flowers, different different activities going on that where the bees could be and make an impact to what that they're already doing or any projects, for example, like if that they're clear cutting an area, if that they're putting in houses, if they're redoing ditches, this is an excellent opportunity where the wallflowers come up and they could benefit from all of the other work that's being done and work in partnership with, with those organizations that are doing that work. From there, they need to, like I said, um, talk to whoever is, how would you say, going to be the champion of this project within that uh, community to then maybe take it forth to like the Northern Association of Community Councils if it's in the Bay Line or talk to Food Matters because, for example, Food, food Matters don't know what programs to put into the community without there being a interest, okay? So if the interest is, is then acknowledged, then they can work with that community to come up with a project for, for that, right? So, so that would be the first steps, I would say, you know, we've been doing this for six years and we are more than open to work in partnership with anybody out there that has uh, the same, you know, mindset as what we do for our bees. And, you know, there were nobody else this far north, so we don't really had a manual to go by. So anything that we've learned, why recreate the wheel? If, mm -hmm. if we can take something and help another outlining community be successful from what we've done, we need to really work together. And in all of that, that's how that you truly create a industry for Northern Manitoba, for seasonal workers in the outlining areas, for a new local uh, specialty food for the communities and any access could be sold at market. So it's just a, it's a win, win, win all the way, right? Yes, absolutely. And I love that. It's, it's about partnerships. That's going to be another piece of advice we add to our, mm -hmm. to our nuggets of wisdom that we've been collecting well, thank you so much, Stephen. That is really great. Yeah, and if you ever need a, t a, a, a taste tester, I, you know, I've got experience in that kind of thing. <laughs> now, have you have you seen? I've gone to go onto Stephen's website. There's there's so many different flavors and things that uh, that that apply to different kinds of um, you know, if you're not feeling well or you just want different tastes and berries. And I've got some at home, and I, I do recommend is you know get on and have a look and just give it a taste. Um, because it's, uh, it's pretty unique also to have some you know, Arctic gold honey. So are we going to be talking about prizes now, Michelle? Yes, we are. Okay, let's get on with it, guys. This is a good part of the show. Um, Stephen, hang around because we're going to give people, uh, show people how to win your, your, a prize related to honey uh, and uh, bees and things. But uh, let me just show you guys what, um, what we do, are doing for prizes here. Every single show, uh, you tune in and you get a chance to win one of these Lenovo tablets. They're great for business and play and heaps of fun and all those things. So Michelle's done a great God job to get some of these to give away on every show. And so all you have to do is put a comment in and we'll tell you about the next one. But for the last one, uh, which was with the Biggity Biggity Puppets. So you just had to write a comment to say what you want the puppets to do next. And we had heaps of great suggestions. And, and let's get on to the wheel. And uh, all those people who made a comment now get the chance to win that tablet. Last week, uh, we gave one to Aaron from, uh, from Churchill. So everyone's got uh, their names in there. And actually, their names are put in there twice. So it's a bit more of a random spin. So let's give this a spin. And someone's going to win a tablet. So OK, let's do it. Spin that wheel. Guys, 
Michelle Schwartz has won a tablet. So Michelle's going to reach out to you and give you a tablet. So that's pretty awesome. Okay, guys, so that's how it works. So let's work on our next uh, competition the next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Tune in, and uh, that's where we'll draw it. And this is how you win it from now until then. So until next sort of end of end of the day next Tuesday, the cutoff is, you have to make a comment inside this uh, live stream video, which will be on the uh, the event, the North Central Development uh, Business Basics event, where you're, where you're watching this right now, just comment in this video. What your comment has to be is, give, give some ideas to Stephen. What you have to put in there is either your favorite flavor of that Stephen does with his honey already, or give him an idea about a different flavor or a combination of whatever it may be. Just, we wanna hear some honey, combinations, flavors, something you like, something that he already does, but we just want to see all those uh, concoctions put into there. Make it a comment, post it, you go into the wheel for next week and someone wins a prize, wins that tablet. So pretty woohoo. What do you reckon, guys? Does that sound good, uh, Stephen? You can't cheat, you can't enter, mate, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds great. I, I'm going to have a good look through that list too because he's got so many different products and different uh, flavors for different needs. Yeah. Excellent. So, Stephen, okay. I'm going to say goodbye to you, but have you got any uh, puns for us? Any BB puns like uh, behave, uh, be, how you been? Uh, I've already used those. So, you got anything new for us? That's, that's, you took the words out of my mouth as, you know, with a short, short season. And, in, you know, in order to be productive, you have to behave. So, I'll leave <laughs> you with that, right? Because be, that's, okay. a, that's a full time job, isn't it, sometimes? So. Sure. Well, thank well, you so much, Stephen. Excellent. Thank you, folks, for having me on you, on the show here. I much appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, Kay. See you later, buddy. Take care. Thanks for being on. Bye. All right. Well, there goes another great guest of this this show, this weekly show. So uh, I'll just make sure we uh, we go. So what's next, Michelle? We've got a couple of extra uh, um, announcements. We do. We've got some workshops coming up. Uh, the governance training is still going on. There are two sessions left, one next Monday uh, for creating your board member manual. And then on Wednesday, February 24th, there's the essentials of succession planning. Okay, so those are still coming up and you can register by contacting our office. You can see at the bottom of the screen there, there is our email address and our phone number. So just call to register for those. And we're also going to be continuing into March offering some different workshops, one of which is called Social Enterprise for Nonprofits. And that's on Monday, March 2nd. So I will um, keep people posted on the ones that are coming up in March, but that is one that they might want to consider. Again, you can just register through our office. And then next Wednesday night, we've got the Indigenous Women's Entrepreneurship Training. And that runs for three weeks, Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. There are 10 spots and I've already filled eight. So there are only two spots available. If you want to register, send me an email or call the office and we will get the registration form to you and get you signed up. For all uh, the women who participate in that, I have 10 tablets. So each woman will get a free tablet at the end of the sessions. So really looking forward to that. It's going to be a great group that we've got. That sounds like a real success. You know, only two, two spots left, so jump into that one. Absolutely. And then I guess let's talk a little bit about our guest next week. Next week, we're going to have, uh, we got, oh, can you say his name, please? His, his, it is Nick DiVirgilio. Nick De Virgilio from Thompson Lions Club, and he's going to be talking about some battery recycling that he's been doing, which does sound uh, interesting if you're into sciencey, technical sort of stuff, which I, I quite like. So, well, yeah. and even if you like money, money, <laughs> because you know, I mean, you wouldn't think of it. We throw things into the garbage dump, and uh, some of those things that we're throwing away are actually worth money. So there is money to be made in battery recycling. And if any communities are interested, that will be the show to watch because uh, there's a way for you to get on board, whether you're a community organization or just an entrepreneur thinking, hey, maybe there's some money. Cool. Well, let's learn something cool. Let's do it next week, Michelle. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Roy. It's been another great show. Cool. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.